Matthew chapter 3, continuing in the second week now of this series. And the series are an, an overstatement. Obviously, I'm, I'm sticking with the same theme. Uh, but these messages, of course, can be encouraging to you. If you didn't hear last week's, this I think will be encouraging to you today. We've been working on understanding who John the Baptist is. And Matthew 3 gives us a beautiful picture of of how John was chosen, really. I mean, he, he was raised up to be a voice crying in the wilderness, the scriptures say of him. And, and so uh, uh, as, he, as he's introduced to us just before Jesus, John becomes that preface to Jesus. Um, he loves the fact that the Savior of the world is coming, and John was determined, in fact determined, to... To, pro to proclaim that to anyone who would hear. His message was repent, right? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And he knew that something significant would happen in his lifetime. And it happened probably earlier than anyone expected. Uh, certainly uh, John was expecting it. Uh, and yet he was uh, surprised. There was other times when, when he was a little confused on whether Jesus was the Messiah that would come because he understood like many in the Jewish faith that they thought the kingdom would be an earthly kingdom. They thought that it would be Israel being restored. And Israel certainly was restored, but not quite in the way that even John thought about. Well, John is uh, by the River Jordan, and he's ministering uh, among the masses. In fact, as I mentioned last week, it's certainly could be compared with a mega church today. But no doubt, the, the depth of commitment that John was calling for was pretty radical. And so this is our Radical Faith series. And I, I want us to, to look at this passage in a different way this morning. We're going to read the same passage. I want us to revisit it. And then I want us to pay attention to when John begins talking to the Pharisees, you remember he, he, he gives them this endearing term, you brood of vipers. <laughs> Not a, I'm being sarcastic, aren't I? Yeah, it wasn't exactly endearing. And so as he, as he says that, pay attention to what he says just after that. Okay, let's read together Matthew 3 and beginning with verse 1 again. In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is, of, this is he who is spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one calling in the desert, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair. He had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and on Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins they were baptized by him in the river Jordan. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not bear, does not produce good fruit, will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me, one will come who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. And he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn, and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Let's pray. Lord, as we consider your word, may your word speak for itself. And as we reflect on these words together with our pastor, with listening ears, may we hear the Holy Spirit. I thank you, Lord, for this message that you are given to each one of us. Lord, I, I, I often reflect when we go through the drive through and we each receive the food that we want to receive from the menu. Lord, in the same way this morning, you are giving a personal, prepared message for each heart that's listening today. I pray that we have listening hearts. The message is different for each one of us. And we pray 
that we would receive it with grace, that we would receive it with passion, that we might, in fact, catch the glimpse of what it means to be a radical Christian for your kingdom and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as I share, share this message with you, I want you to know that, and I want to comment in your, in your bulletin, see if I have one here, I sure do. Um, in your bulletin, on the back is a place for you to, to fill out sermon notes. Some of you know that I've uh, gone with kind of the fill in the blank for years and years, and I've stopped doing that. Uh, one, if I put it in the bulletin with blanks, that means Saturday night I can't change my mind. But it's more than that. The Lord is speaking. I've also noticed that when we do fill in the blank, when you fill in that last blank, you put in your Bible, you close your Bible, and you're like, you're, I'm not sure you're listening. And I'm, I'm sure you are, but I, I, I want to encourage you that your bulletin now has certainly our, our mission statement at the bottom and all of the important things that we believe. And in January, actually, I'm going to preach a three-message series on two values per Sunday. That'll be an insightful thing there. But this is blank for this reason. The way I just prayed. God has a message for you. And I want you, I don't care if I have one point or 20, if you just remember one thing, this is where you can write that down. When God speaks to you, and, and so you just go, oh man, I forgot about that. When you say, oh, I forgot about that, that's when you should write it down. <laughs> or when you go, I've never heard that before. It's been said many times, but I'll, I'll just, you might be hearing it in this context in your life, at this point where you're at, write it down. So you keep your own sermon notes. So it, it doesn't let you off the hook. You fill that in. Some people are writers, some people are not. And so, uh, if you just need to sit and listen, that's, that's fine too. But I just want to encourage you with that. That's one of the reasons, I, I just felt like maybe I was like, just giving us all this same message. I want God to give us a unique message for each person here today. Because God's got you in mind. He's got, he's got his eyes right on you right now. And he's speaking to you, so let's hear what he has to say. Now, in the first part of verse 9, we hear this word, and do not think for yourselves, do not think you can say to yourselves, John's saying to the Pharisees, we have Abraham as our father. That's what I want to work on today. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. That's a pretty bold statement. God can raise up children from these stones. Well, in fact, that's exactly what he did back in the Garden of Eden. He made us from the dust, didn't he? And so God knows exactly what he's doing, and he's creative. And look at you today. We are an amazing lot, aren't we? We're all so different. And God has made us incredibly unique, and he loves us today. We spoke on the, this, this theme last week about the kind of fruit that you're to bear when there's truly this repentant heart from within. When you turn to God and you repent as we spoke, is there a fruit that keeps up with your repentance? It's an interesting phrase, isn't it? And it's, your, uh, it, it's also your memory verse for this month, so don't miss that card in your bulletin. I know it's unique. You might go, wow, it's, uh, it is one whole verse, but it's a short one. But I want you to reflect on that. Pray through it throughout the month um, to repent, to, to have fruit that matches your repentance. Uh, that's kind of what we talked about last week. You see, John the Baptist's lifestyle is followed here by a, it's a dismantling of excuses that we begin to even speak to ourselves because it, when we use these excuses, it gets us out of our assignments from God. Or we, it allows us to wander in our walk through life. Or our desire to skip class. Or to drop out of school, right? All of those things that can happen when we don't uh, want to do what we know we should do. Can you hear your father saying when you disobey him, when he says to you, don't think you can, and finish that phrase. When your father says, don't think that you're going to get away with this. Don't think that you can stay out past curfew and not face the wrath. Right? <laughs> or don't think you can fool me with that line. I know what's going on. 
I know what time you came in. Don't think you can tell me you forgot. How many things would we say to our parents? And, and in fact, how many times do we say something like that to God? Or, or forget to address them at all? As if you think he's not watching. I told you, he's got his eyes on you this morning. And it's a wonderful set of eyes. God the Father is, is with you, and you're his kid. And although sometimes we need to be disciplined, he's the same Father that wraps his arm around you and loves you to death. That's the spirit of John's comments to the Pharisees and the Fed and the Sadducees as they approach John to come against the work God has called John to do. They called him to do a work. What is his do not think you question is hiding behind Abraham's lineage? You see, what did lineage mean to the, to the Israelites? It meant everything, didn't it? It meant Abraham was their spiritual father. The Israelites believed that, that Abraham was their spiritual father. In fact, I, I think Abraham kind of was kind of substituted into that place where they would address God. Wow. It meant all the Jews were going to heaven no matter what they did. A Jew could go out and commit murder, murder and be a mercenary. But they believed that, he, that that person was covered by the lineage of Abraham if they were a Jew. Abraham had uh, built up a treasure of merit, they thought, uh, which not all the Jews believed. And I'm taking, there's about four statements here that I found in uh, the commentary by, by Barclay. And he, and he says these things. Abraham built up a treasure of merit, which not all the Jews believed that simply because they were Jews and not for any merit of their own, they were safe in the life to come because of Abraham. Jews talked about the delivering of the merits of the Father. They believed that. The Jews said that Abraham was at the gates of Gehenna, which is another word for hell. The Jews said that the, Abraham was at the gates of Gehenna to turn back any Israelite who might by chance have been consigned to its terrors. And finally, the Jews said it was on the merits of Abraham that caused the safety of the seas. And I'm mistaken, there's one more at the top of the next page. The Jews even believed it was by the merits of Abraham that Moses entered heaven and that it was the same for David that he would be heard by God because of the merits of the Father. If the children, be said of Abraham, were mere dead bodies without blood vessels or bones or merits of, Ab of Abraham, they would enter the kingdom of heaven because of the merits of Abraham. This was strong, as you can tell. And that's what the Pharisees, Sadducees believed. And so John was coming against that. Don't think that you can hide behind the lineage of Abraham. He's serious. In fact, if you think you can merit uh, with Abraham, God can tell these stones to inherit the kingdom of God before you. He was strong. He was strong with those words, wasn't he? You see, they were de truly depending on the lineage of Abraham for their salvation. Is it possible that we are doing the same today? Do we slip into our lineage forms and assumptions that things will go our way because of some fortune of the past? Could this be one of the severest problems of the Christian church in America today? Complacency is a dangerous thing. Cruising might be great for a vintage car, but is it survivable in the Christian life? Are we in America living on the shirt tails of Christian virtue that has blessed the Western world? There is a momentum of blessing that has come from centuries past. Christendom in America. Are we living on those coattails? And could it be that us living on those coattails and just riding with complacency our lives out and not really being all that God wants us to be, that we are on a dead-end run in America because our church is beginning to really fail? I was sitting with our superintendent a couple weeks ago in, in one of our conference meetings with leadership, and, and he says we have a... 805 free Methodist churches in North America. 
The bishops have identified 105 of those 805 that are truly healthy and growing congregations. 105. What is wrong with us? I didn't even ask if we were one of the 105. It didn't matter. Because we're coming back and we're working on this, aren't we? Amen. We come back and we've got to work on it. We've got to be all in followers of Jesus because we want to reflect who Jesus is to this world. Do we reflect him? Do we reflect him? This is our issue, isn't it? I'm not saying that we're just all like the Pharisees and Sadducees. They were in serious deep water with God. But we could be too if we're not careful. What would Abraham want us to know? <laughs> think of that. What would Abraham want us to be thinking today if he were here with us? He said, you guys, you got me so high on a pedestal, I'm above the roof you just put on in your church. I can't even get in your church. You got me so high. That's wrong. And other, other, uh, other manners in which we lift high, and we need to let those things come down to earth. Abraham left his home. Abraham wandered most of his life in the desert. But he listened to God, and he just did what God asked him to do. We don't need another Abraham. We need you. God wants you in your unique form to be a blessing in his kingdom because he's made you for exactly that. Let's talk about some ways in which we can affirm our family lineage. So we've talked about a little bit how family lineage gets in the way. But what about the good things that come from family lineage? And let's, let me illustrate a couple for you. The first thing I want you to think about this morning is that God's the one who made you. I know it seems simple, but it's what's on my heart. Uh, John says, and I take it right out of the text, God can raise up children. God's the one that raises up children from the beginning. We have to start there with the most basic. Will you trust God to raise you up? Would you trust God to raise you up? You don't have to wait for your parents to raise you, although there's efforts there. You don't have to wait for your shit to come in. God is here and now. No waiting, no delays. God is waiting for you to simply say yes to Him. You might be a new Christian, an old one, or a wavering one. God is ready. He's ready. You see, Zacchaeus was new. Zacchaeus was new. Anna, with Jesus, when he was dedicated at the temple, she was old. So we could be new. We could be old. And we could be in that middle wandering place like Nicodemus. Where are you today? Young, old, in between? I don't know. But God is ready because He is the one who made you. And He's the one that makes children, that raises us up. You see, the Pharisees and Sadducees were reminded that Abraham didn't raise them up. God did. Abraham didn't create them. God did. This world did not define you. God defined you. And your parents, as much as they thought they loved you and raised you upright, they are not. Are you listening? Your parents are not your ticket in to the kingdom of heaven. Did I say that? They are not. Your relationship with Jesus, your choosing of the Savior, yourself, your embracing the good, good Father, as we said earlier, is the key to the kingdom of God and salvation. We need to stand up and believe that no matter what our lineage, we are God's man, we are God's woman, and we are unstoppable for that very fact. Listen to this from Jeremiah. For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, to not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future, then you can call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. Did you catch that last phrase? Then you will call on me and you will come to me and pray to me and I will listen to you. I felt that this morning. Why in the world did I get up an hour later, an extra hour of sleep and feel I was so discombobulated 
That's a word. That, that I was so messed up in the head this morning. I woke up and I was like, which side of the bed is up? And I don't know why. Anybody else have that feeling when the time changes? I don't know what. Okay, I don't know. All right. But, but there's just one of those days when we call on God, when we come and pray to Him. And I began to pray and just, and it all got fixed once I got myself out of bed, right? And began to find the, the floor. That's the way God works. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. These are wonderful words of, of God choosing us, making us as his children, and of course leading us on. God will raise you up if you trust him to do that. And, and here's the beautiful truth of that. Number two, God can use anything from anywhere for any purpose. This is just the truth of it. God can use anything from anywhere for any purpose. It's right there in the text with John. He says God can raise up children from these stones. I mean, don't tempt God. God can do whatever He wants to do when He wants to do it. And, and we don't always believe that, do we? We really don't believe that God can take our grief and make us happy again. We don't believe that God can take an absent space in our heart and fill it again with His presence or with the relevance in this world that will make us feel safe again. We often don't believe that God has special plans for us in our life. But I'm telling you that that's a lie from Satan. It is a lie from this world. And if you're not careful, every two or three minutes, you'll be fed yet another lie. And so you've got to fight the fight. You've got to believe the things that God teaches you in His Word. That's why it's important to be in the Word. Because God can use anything from anywhere for any purpose, so long as we are seeking Him, as we just shared from Jeremiah. But Ephesians 3.20 says in our text this morning, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ever ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. That's what God does for you and for me. He is, he is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever imagine or even ask. Wow. Let me introduce you to Jeremiah this morning. Not Jeremiah of the Scriptures, who we just quoted. But Jeremiah, who came to visit my house yesterday. Jeremiah arrived at our house after a day-long journey, a uh, kind of a, a day walk, not a walk, they rode the car, but they spent the whole day celebrating Jeremiah's birthday. Jeremiah turned 10 years old today. Our friend, Judy and I, from a previous uh, ministry down in Westland, Jeremiah wanted to celebrate his birthday yesterday, so his mom and, and siblings took him across the landscape of southern Michigan area and ended up here in Port Huron. Uh, we made the connection through Facebook, actually through Judy, and they decided that they would end here. There were, uh, Kristen, uh, his mother, planned ten stops she had done this for each of her previous two children, and it was Jeremiah's turn, the youngest of three. And so here came Jeremiah after a day of breakfast being number one, getting gas number two. She had to be creative, okay? And, and they ended with a number of stops like Chuck E. Cheese and all of those things you do for a child when they, they want a fun birthday. And, and, but they ended at our house, well, actually for step number nine, because... Jeremiah received a new bicycle. What Kristen found out from her son was that he could ride really, really fast. And the faster he could ride, the more fun he would have. But the problem with his bike, the faster he would go, he had no brakes. This boy would ride like the wind, and, she, and his longest ride was, what, last year or the year before, 22 miles with his mom and some others that went on a pretty good ride. And he said, Randy... Uh, Christian said, Randy, I, I'd like him to come on a bike ride with you. Would, you. would you let us come and do that? I said, sure, sure, it's November. And so 
Jeremiah rolled into our driveway in the car, and the family was there, and we greeted them, and we saw his new mongoose bike, and it had brakes. And it had all of the 21 gears that you would want. He didn't know there were more than two on his previous bike. And, and so we got his bike all tuned up. I got 14 layers of clothing on and got my bike out and, and hadn't ridden that thing in over a month and, or more. And, and so we went out and we embarked after pictures and fun, right? This was stage nine. Dinner was stage 10. I enjoyed that too. And, and so I started to think, I was, obviously I was thinking about this message. Saturday night pastors are doing their, their thinking of the message for the next day. I, I was working on this point and all, all week I couldn't come up with how to illustrate what it means for God to use anything from anywhere for any purpose. But here came Jeremiah. And he just wants, he wants to do something big in life. Don't we all? And so he and I rode out of the driveway with our bike helmets, our flashing lights, and, and made our way around. I made him obey the traffic laws, so we had to go one way, one way, and then go around the block. And we got over to the corner uh, where we're going to cross 10th. I was going to take him down to the mile uh, walk down by the St. Clair River and then end up underneath. And I told him, I used all these big phrases with him, we're going to go to the International Bridge. <laughs> to Canada. And he goes, this is Jeremiah. Wow. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and then we, we rode down the, the street. We went over to the, 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 some sort of a seaway terminal. That's what it was. And we went down that little hill to get down to the, off the bluff. And we took that path. We went by the, the, the first uh, ship that's now docked, right? And I said, that's the Bramble. We got to the bottom of the hill. We took a picture in front of the Bramble. That was in the movie Batman. He goes, wow. <laughs> God can use anything for any, uh, it can do anything for anything for any purpose. And, and so we took a picture there. And, and Judy and Kristen are waiting, Where, when are they going to come? They must be doing something. And so we're riding along. And we go over to the Maritime Center and go by, what is it, the Gray Fox? And then go by the Hollyhock. And I said, this is the really... The, the boat they use now, and he goes, wow. And we got by the light ship, and then he came around the corner, and he sees the big, the big, uh, the big bridge. And so he and I took another picture. He's like, he's a pretty short guy, and I'm crouching down. I didn't want to show you any of the pictures, because it looks really goofy. And, and so we took another picture, and the, the girls were waiting for us, and we make our way. I just want you to know that little Jeremiah, at 10 years old today, I know his heart as a young man of God. Like his brother and sister, this family is seeking the Lord, our good friends. Jeremiah wants to do something big, big for God. And so I, I, before we rode, I took him up to our bedroom, and they had all of the, the wombat shirts laid out on the bed. I said, pick one. You can borrow it. <laughs> I wouldn't give it to him. He, he wore a wombat, and we went on our first official wombat Right. For some of you, that's a bike trip that we take each year. I won't tell you about it now, but that's what it is. And so we went on that, that ride. And in the end, Jeremiah, because a mother knew that lineage could only go so far, she knew how to introduce him to other Christians, other believers, and the kingdom of God that God can do, and can use anything from anywhere for any purpose. And Jeremiah's on his way. He's on his way. That's what God does. At, ask John the Baptist the same thing. John will always look back and he'll ask, why did God choose me to introduce the Son of God to the world? Can you imagine what John the Baptist is doing in heaven today? He's still pinching himself going, I do not deserve it. I do not deserve the task that was given to me, but I'm thankful. Why me? Because God can use anything from anywhere for any purpose. Listen to this from Ephesians 3.16. Beautiful passage. 
I pray out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. I, I don't want to keep reading. I want you to read this with me. Let's read. Let's read this in unison. I'm going to start over, okay? Are you ready? I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with the power through his Holy Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power and together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, how high, how deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the measure of the fullness of God. Wow. What were those last three words? The fullness of God. What is God thinking? Why would He come to you and me and fill us with the fullness of God? That just rocks me. I think that it's, we can start to agree that these scriptures we're using, it really is a radical message. The fullness of God? He made the universe for crying out loud. Why is he paying such careful attention to us? Because we're his kids. And he loves us to death. And he wants everything for us. He wants to do wonderful things through us. Hmm. Well, this is good news, isn't it? So how do we end this message? Got one more point, and it's a more difficult one. You see, there's a, there's a warning that we finish with. God can take it all away. God can take it all away. Listen to what John says to the Pharisees. The axe is already applied at the root of the tree. Wow. Verse 10. That's a strong warning. You see, a parent is not a good parent because they just give you what you want. Sometimes a good parent gives you what you need. And God's not going to allow the Pharisees and the Sadducees, or anyone else for that matter, into the kingdom of heaven if they don't want to be there. You said that's really the root of all of this. Do we really want God or do we just want our own way? The axe is already applied to the root of the trees. There was no mincing words when John speaks these direct words to the Pharisees. It's serious business to him. And John's not taking any prisoners. He, in fact, is willing to threaten them. Wow. It says the first, the whole verse says this. The axe is already at the root of the trees. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown out thrown into the fire. Let me share with you a story of, uh, of a man that I think is misunderstood. I came upon his story. I've never uh, fully understood the whole story of Uncle Tom's Cabin, written by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Some of you probably have read that book or maybe seen that movie. I want to talk about this controversial personality of our time and maybe our past. But nonetheless, he's important to our conversation today. Uncle Tom is the character from the book, Uncle Tom's Character, or the movie, if you've seen that. I've heard the term many times. In fact, I've heard it even recently referenced in our own community. So I decided to look it up. I Googled it and began to do some research into it. And I, the, the term, being an Uncle Tom, for a black person is actually been conveyed as a derogatory term. Uncle Tom in some circles today is, is defined, and this is from a quote, an eager black man who is eager to win the approval of the white man. Hmm. He's willing to betray his own race for the purpose of gaining stature and approval of the white race. This, of course, is the portrayal of the movie version of Harriet Beecher Stowe's book, Uncle Tom's Cabin. But it is amazingly contrasted differently 
in the book that Stowe had written. You see, here's a quote from uh, Harriet's book. Actually, he's, she begins to write in this book how Uncle Tom is a defender of all people. In fact, he's a truth teller if you really understand the book correctly. Here's a quote from the book that's, that helps you understand John the Baptist's message today. Uncle Tom is actually a Christian in this book and a hero at the end. I quote, Tom is ordered by Simon Legree, the immoral slave owner, to flog a female slave. Tom refuses. Legree strikes him repeatedly with a cowhide lash. Again, he tells Tom to beat the woman. Tom, with a soft voice, says, The poor critter's sick and feeble. It would be downright cruel. It would, and, and it what I would never do, nor begin to. Mister, he says, if you mean to kill me, kill me. But as to my raising my hand against anyone here, I shall never, I'll die first. Doesn't sound to me like a black man trying to please a white slave owner. In fact, this story is written by Harriet Beecher Stowe uh, from the inspired the true story of Josiah Henson be well before the beginning of the Civil War. Born near Port Tobacco, Maryland around 1789, Henson's first memory was of his own father whipped, having his ear cut off and sold south as punishment for striking a white man who had attempted uh, attempted uh, to rape his wife. I don't know if there's children in here, I'm sorry. Um, Henson never saw his father again. Henson was later separated from his mother and sold to a child trafficker, but soon fell deathly ill. The slave trader offered the boy to Henson's mother's owner, an alcoholic gambler named Isaac Rylery, for a bargain. He could have him uh, free of charge if the youth Henson 